For the Lord is good and his mercies endure forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, Father, bless that offering in Jesus' name. We say that because you have given, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's good to be home. Hallelujah. I tell you, I, I like going out because I like what God does when we're out, but I sure like home. Amen. Praise God. Turn me over to John, the first chapter. I want to talk about the power source of God's kingdom. Um, you know, it's always good to know the power source. It's always, know, it's always good to know how to plug into it. You know, if you take your uh, hair dryer, your hair blower over to Europe and try plugging it in over there, you're going to find you're in big trouble. You're going you're gonna to have to buy a hair dryer while you're over there. So because there's an adaptation to their power system over there. And uh, we need to know how to plug into the power source or the power system of the kingdom. Uh, the Lord had spoke to Billy Brim and, and uh, told her about, about Oral Roberts. says, you know, most people lap God, but, uh, but Oral Roberts learned how to tap into God. Right. And so learning how to tap into God is, is so important. And to understand that God's got a power source that, that is, is unfallible. It's, it will never fail. And, of course, we're talking about love. You say, well, you talk about love a lot. Pastor Mike's always talking about love. But I'll tell you what, Pastor John and I were talking one day, and, and he made this statement. He said, if I had it all, to do all over again, he said, I would take new believers and teach them about the love of God before I taught them about anything else. Because when you learn to walk in the power source of God, you'll see a lot more happen. I asked the Lord one time, how do I lay hands on people? I mean, I, I saw my pastor lay hands on people and, and she just, you know, she'd go after it, you know, and pray. And I'm thinking, you know, God, that's not me. And I'd see somebody else do all kinds, you know, you'd see people. So I asked the Lord one day and he said, Karen, if you'll just lay your hands on them and let and release my love, my love will not fail to go to their need. And so... Uh, so it's important that we understand love. And, of course, we've got all, you know, the Bible gives us all kinds of definitions about love. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 and so on. We might get in a little bit of that. But, but I want you to, to look here, uh, the power source of God, the very, the very essence of God that shines off of God. We call it glory. But it shines off of God out of his love. It's like he's got an inward source that makes him shine. It's an inward source that makes him glow. It's an inward source that, that causes him to, uh, to walk, walk into some place that's dark and light. It, it's a source that he can speak into darkness and say, light be, and light was. And, and, and everything that comes out of God is love. Everything that comes out of God in love. Even as a Christian, when he, when he uh, you know, uh, begins to judge things in our life, he never comes in and says, you know, Glenn, you're just a no good scum and you'll never be anything. God doesn't do that. Devil does that. But God says, you know, Glenn, this area of your life is hindering you. And I, want, I long with everything that's in me to get to you what you need. But you've got to deal with this area of your life. That's right. See, that's how God deals with you. God doesn't condemn you. God doesn't put the hammer down on you. He comes to you out of his power source and brings light or illumination or revelation to you the next step you need to take in your life, the next thing you need to do. Back on the 21st of August, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. He said, the next 40 days, I want you to walk softly before me. I want you to do more listening than talking to me. And boy, I tell you, I've been hearing some stuff. <laughs> and, and, you know, some of it's about me, but, you know, some of it's about other things. But, you know, he just began to reveal in me 
things that were hindering me in, in receiving my healing and receiving, you know, the things I need in my life. And they weren't these big, bad, ugly things. They were just attitudes and they were, uh, you know, a way I've thought all my life. You know, Michael talks about having, you know, habits or thought patterns that don't line up with the Word of God. And he began to t talk to me about, I've got an assignment that you've got to get in alignment with. And, and you've got a purpose in your life. It's already wrote in the book, Psalms 139. He's already wrote your life out in a book. Uh, you know, that book is in heaven, and it is witnessing to you every day. It's speaking to you. Your purpose is speaking to you every day. But a lot of times, because we walk in darkness in areas of our life, we don't see or hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us because our darkness has become a deception that even if God says, you know, I love you, we can't accept that because we've got a dark perception. We've received a lie in our life that won't allow us to let God love us. And so, so God's, God's very power source, his love, comes to us as light, comes to us as revelation. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. God loves the world, but the whole world can't receive that because of the darkness they live in. And that's why we have got to be the children of light. We have got to be the light in their darkness. Amen? Isaiah 60 talks about the world's going to get pretty dark. <laughs> gross darkness, he calls it. You know, there's something that's yucky, but there's something that's worse. It's called gross, <laughs> you know. And, you know, darkness is yucky, but gross darkness is you can't see your hand in front of your face. You can't see truth. Even when it spoke to you, you can't see truth. And so there's got to be a bursting forth of light that comes to a person's life, and it's going to come through the vehicle of love. And so let's look here at John, the first chapter. Let's go ahead and start with the first verse. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made uh, that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And it says, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. When a person is operating in darkness, that you can take that two ways if you look at the transmission, uh, transmission, <laughs> translations, if you look at, if you look at it, um, you know, it's, it says not only can they can't understand it, but they can't hold it back. The devil can't. The devil has no answer to the love of God. The devil has no answer to the light of God when it shows up. And so, and you've got to understand, even when you witness to somebody, you tell them about Jesus, you share the word with them, the Bible calls the word of God an incorruptible seed. And every time you speak to somebody, there's a light and a life in that seed. Isn't that what Jesus said? The words I speak, they're spirit and life. Spirit and life. And so when you speak the word of God to somebody, there's, there's enough spirit and life in that seed that there'll be a point in time that that seed will spring forth in their life. God is so wise. He's just so wise. It says over in Corinthians, it says that, that God, spoke, God spoke in darkness. He didn't go into darkness. He was there and he spoke, and it light bursted forth and set people free, set the earth creation free. So I'm telling you, when you're speaking the word of God out of love by the voice of God, you're speaking the word of God into a person's life. There's enough life and spirit in that seed to bring forth a harvest at some point or another. So never give up on a word that you give somebody. Never give up on it because it, it's incorruptible. The devil doesn't know what to do with that. Amen? He just tries to keep piling darkness on it, but light always bursts forth in darkness. Amen? So he says here in verse 5, And the light shines in the darkness, 
and the darkness did not comprehend it. It doesn't, when somebody's in darkness, they can't comprehend it. I was speaking to somebody this last week, and I mean, they just had a really bad opinion of their self, and I'm, I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, you gotta be kidding me. You know, you gotta be kidding me because they were so totally opposite to what they were believing. And, and you try to tell them, no, you, you know, you're, you're anointed and you're, you're powerful and God loves you and, you know, and it's always, yeah, but, yeah, but, any times, yeah, but, yeah, but, they're not seeing what you're saying. They're not comprehending the darkness, the lie, the, de- you know, the, the, um, the, uh, not denial, that's not the word, the deception, yeah, the deception in them is so dark they can't see. But what you do is you just keep putting the word in there and it'll burst forth one day. It'll come forth. So Jesus' life was and is the source of light. And Jesus, there's no greater act of love than Jesus Christ. Amen? His life delivered mankind from darkness. Turn to me over to Colossians 1. Hallelujah. I love the word of God. Sometimes he just gives me a path through the word, and it's like, wow, God. Hallelujah. Colossians 1. uh, uh, Yeah, Colossians 1. I studied in a different Bible at home, so I was looking for it on the page that my Bible is at home, not this one. I thought I was lost here for a minute. It says, in verse 12 of chapter 1, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Darkness has a power, but its power is not greater than the light. I know that because you can turn all the lights off in here and it be as dark as can be and but that that darkness does not have the power to stay here when we turn a light switch on. It, it disappears. So darkness has a power as long as somebody keeps giving it power. You keep telling yourself the same lies you've been telling yourself all your life, and you'll never see the light in that area of your life. But when you take that area of life, like, like Pastor is saying, get in a habit of saying, God, where am I deceived? Where where am I not connected with my purpose? Where am I not aligned to your assignment in my life? And as he begins to show you those areas of your life, and, you know, I say, Father, I see that. That's the first thing I do is when he shows it to me, I say, I see that. Forgive me. I repent. I renounce that. I push, I cast that out of me. It cannot stay in my soul any longer. You don't, get, you don't give it the power to remain. Yeah. You speak to that lie. You speak to that area of darkness in your life, and you command it to shut down, and you speak light into it. Yeah. I had a situation this last week where, uh, in fact, he was teaching me some of this, and um, um, uh, he began to talk to me uh, about an area of my life, and it was like, oh, my God, I see that. I see that. I had a knowing, but it's like when he finally reveals it to you, sometimes he'll give you things, just pieces through your life. Just pieces. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. And they're like pieces of a puzzle. They're just falling in line, falling in line. And before you know it, all the pieces have fell in line and you see the picture. It's like, oh my goodness, why didn't I see that before? Because you didn't have all the pieces. See, God just doesn't doesn't just bring the whole puzzle already put together and glued on a board and give it to you. You won't see it. It won't make sense to you. But he's, he's a loving father, and he works in your life piece by piece, bit by bit, until all of a sudden you see the whole picture, and, and, and you hear the promises of God. You can take the promises of God, and all those words that he gave you down through the years that were those pieces... And you, now you can go and, and, and you can take a stand and say, devil, no more. Yeah. I put the axe to the root. Yeah. You know, and sometimes you may not even know what the root is. That might come a little bit later down the road. But you put the axe to it anyway. Yeah. And, and you take the word of God 
and you begin to see yourself in that word, in the light of what he's shown you, in the love that he's shown that to you. And as you, as you uh, begin to apply your life and your thinking, that's why Paul tells us in Romans 12, too, to renew our mind. Why? Because the devil's got your mind screwed up. I hate to pop your bubble. You know, you may think you have it all together, but you don't. I don't. And when we realize that the devil has used words in our lives to, to build a wall to separate us from God, he's, he, you know, he just keeps, you know, he, he builds it high enough and then he starts, then he starts layer, making it thicker and thicker and thicker in your life. The Lord showed me one time, he said, your life is like a fine piece of wood. It's got this beautiful grain in it. It's been hand planed and hand picked, and, and it's a beautiful piece of grain. But he says, the day you're born, words, the devil makes sure words start coming. In fact, some science has even proved that even when a baby's in a womb, it hears the words. <laughs> and, and the devil begins to see he's a spirit he doesn't know your total future but he knew that when God breathed into your mother's womb your life he breathed your purpose and your destiny he breathed a word into you and the devil heard that and from the time you were conceived until the time you die the devil works to destroy that purpose in your life. He begins to put one layer of paint over that beautiful wood. And all of a sudden you get to a place in your life that there's not even a piece of grain showing. You don't even know who you are because it's all been covered. And that wood, that grain, that beautiful grain underneath all that paint is hidden in darkness. And that's what a lie will do to you. But God begins to go in and he, he puts that paint remover of the Holy Ghost on you. And he begins to work in your life until you get back to that original grain, that original purpose for that piece of wood. And, and that's what God's after. The devil is, is the, was the cherub that covered. And he's still covering. But it's an unholy covering. Amen? And he'll cover you with words and he'll cover you... With, with things that make you think, how could God possibly love me? I've done this, and I've done that, and I could never accomplish that, and I could never be that, and I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. <laughs> That's a hateful lie from the devil. A hateful lie from the devil. But God speaks words of love over you. He speaks words of life over you. And he's delivered you. Let's look here at, uh, uh, let's go ahead and turn over to, uh, uh, we, we didn't read these words, did we? This is uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 12. But thanks be unto God who has qualified us. Say, I'm qualified. qualified. To be partakers. Hallelujah, of the inheritance of the saints in light. He delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us or transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So there's your power source. And it's important that we understand that the power in us is love and anything outside the love of God takes us outside the kingdom of light and puts us in a position to be deceived. You know, uh, uh, let's turn over to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. I got lots of scriptures because I love the scriptures. Ephesians 5, let's look at verse 8. It says, For you were once darkness... For you were once darkness, not you were in darkness. You were once darkness. There was no light in you. There's no light on, and there's never any light until you flip the switch of repentance in your life. And then the light comes on. But now, hallelujah, you are light in the Lord. 
walk as children of light. So he's saying here, here's your purpose, here's the plan, walk in my light. And when we get outside the love of God, we get outside the light of God. And we then give darkness the power to overtake us. And so it's important that we stay in that light. That light and that radiance is, like I said, the love of God. The love of God is pure light. There's no defilement in that. There's no defilement in that. It's pure light. It's honest. It's truthful. It's quick to trust. It's, it's quick to justify. It's quick to shield. It's quick to have forbearance. It's quick to appreciate. It's quick to give. It's quick to help and forgive. I left all that what it wasn't out that chapter 13 says. It says it's not this, but it's this. I, I got rid of what it's not <laughs> and gave you the real thing. It's, it's, it's honest and truthful. It's quick to trust, quick to justify, quick to shield, quick to for, forbear, quick to appreciate, quick to give, quick to help, and quick to forgive. Quick, 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 quick. Not somebody offends you and you go stew in your soup for a week. Quick. Quick. Why? Because you're letting darkness in. And we can't, in this day and age, it's dark enough out here. We can't let it in us. We can't let it in us. Everything in the kingdom functions in and out of love. Love is the power source because God is the source. Amen. And he is love. Amen? Uh, Romans, we won't turn there for the sake of time, but Romans 8.39 uh, says that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing, nothing in our spirit can separate us from the love of God. But there are outside forces that will. He says, neither life nor death, neither principalities. He starts listing all these outside forces that are working day and night to get you out of the love of God, to get you out, outside in the darkness, to, to take the bait and get pulled out into darkness. Because once the devil can pull you in darkness, he can deceive you. And if he can deceive you, he can keep you out of your purpose. And so, so it says there, it says uh, there's the, uh, there in Rome, uh, Romans 8, 39, there is no outside force that can, out, that can cut off God's love for us. Even in our failures, <laughs> even in our failures, God loves us. That's why he gave us 1 John 1, 9, an out. You can get out of that darkness. You may have fell into it, but you can get out of it. 1 John 1, 9, he's, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Anything that's dark, he can cleanse us from that. Only you can put up the wall or the hindrance. It doesn't stop God from loving you and wanting to help you, but our actions and our attitudes sometimes separate us. God never separates himself from us but we separate ourselves from God when we begin to let the devil dictate our attitudes, our feelings. <laughs> you know, fear is a feeling. Uh, uh, anger is a feeling. You know, I, you know, the Lord started talking to me this last week, and he said, he says, you've dealt with things in anger all your life. See, anger can be a tool in your life that that is a destructive tool now in God I mean I have I have a an anger toward the devil and what he's doing in people's lives and that's that's a righteous anger but but when I when I take something Sabrina might say to me and offend me and because I don't know how to cope with what she said or how to handle what she said I lash back at her in anger and I go home and I'm angry Instead of dealing with this, quick. Remember, we talk about what does love do? It's quick. <laughs> it's quick to forgive. It's quick to shield. It's quick to forbearance. You know, it's quick to be long-suffering. Like Pastor says, what's long-suffering? Suffering long. Sometimes you just got to suffer with people's ignorance, you know, or people's attitudes. Yeah, or your own ignorance. 
But, but it's, it's us that separates us from God. God never sep. Once you become his child, he never separates himself from you. you. The day you receive Jesus Christ is the last day you'll ever be alone. Amen. You know, I don't know about you, but there's been times I've been in a, crowd and fe- in a crowd of people and feel like I'm all alone. That lonesomeness just wants to come over you, you know. And, you know, it's wanting to separate you. Feelings. Now, there's nothing wrong with feelings. There's nothing good or bad about feelings. They're just feelings. They're just feelings. But how you regulate that feeling, if you regulate it out of the love of God, it will benefit you. If you regulate it out of uh, of hurt emotions. Now, I'm not telling you that you're not going to get your feelings hurt once in a while. You ought to be in the ministry. People have got all kinds of opinions about you. Yeah, and if you believed them all, you'd crawl out in a fetal position in a corner someplace and turn out all the lights and say the party's over. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's been days I felt like doing that. But you, can't, you cannot live by the opinions of men. You've got to live by the opinions of God. Is that easy? No, it's not sometimes. Sometimes you've got to dig in. You know, I remember being in a situation, I was walking down the ditch bank, and, and I said, God, this thing is either going to push me into you deeper or it's going to pull me away. I choose to be pushed in deeper. There are sometimes you just got to make a decision when you're in the middle of a hot mess that you're going to push your way into God. Because he's your power source. The love that he has for you will not fail to get you through the situation. You live in a life that's full of speed bumps. The devil makes sure they're full of speed bumps. But Jesus says, don't be afraid. He says, if you're going to live in this world, you're going to have temptations. You're going to have trials. You're going to have tribulation. You're going to be persecuted. But he said, don't be afraid. I have overcome. His love for us has overcome every circumstance in your life. And he can change your circumstances. Turn with me over. We're just going to kind of shift a little bit, but I'm going to bring you back. Turn over with me to 1 John, the second chapter. I I love the book of John, and I love the book of 1 John. Sometimes I read that first chapter of John over there and this first chapter of 1 John, and I just just bask in that. It's just, it's wonderful. I love the book of 1 John because it's a book about love. You know, how do we, how do we function in that love in the body of Christ? And so he, he says here in uh, chapter 2, uh, let's, let's start with... Um, can't read my writing here. Chapter, let's start with verse 9. <laughs> says, he who, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. That word hate there, if you look it up, it's not just I'm, I'm angry at you and I don't like you. I hate you. You know, I don't know about you, but I've been mad at, been mad at my husband or mad at my parents or something like I hate you <laughs> you know not not late not lately and I never did it to your face I always did it as you went out the door <laughs> but but this is this is a hate this word hate here actually means now listen to persecute by mocking gossiping or criticizing. Ouch. I said the same thing. Oh, yeah. He says he, let's, let's read it again, verse 9. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. And he, but he, verse 10, he who loves his brother abides in light and there is no cause for him to stumble. Ooh, hallelujah. John says later on, he says, if you'll walk in that light, if you'll walk in that love, you will not have an occasion to stumble. See, there's no darkness in that love. 
There, there's no tripping spot in that love. And it says in, in, in verse 11, it says, But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So you can see the whole attempt of the enemy to get you over an offense and hatred and criticizing and gossiping and persecuting and mocking people. You know, I see that mocking spirit in the church a whole lot. I've been guilty of it. You know, you go to a church, they kind of do things a little bit different. You go home and you tell people where you've been and what they did. <laughs> yeah, darkness. Darkness. Because how I say it's darkness is because you're looking at a group of people who are worshiping God and the revelation they have, and they have a pure heart toward God, and you're making fun of the way they do it. You know, do I think some people are strange when they worship God? Yeah, I do, but I probably am strange to some of you. You know? And so... So you put yourself in a position to judge another man's servant. Now you've just put yourself, there's a little drop of darkness dropped on the inside of you. And you know, it's real funny. You know, you can take, you can take uh, a, a drop of ink and drop it into a clear glass of water, and it just kind of drops to the bottom. But if you put a lid on that and shake it up, the whole, water's ta the whole water takes on the color. See, the devil always sees that he drops that little drop of hate, and then he brings something along to shake you up real good. The Bible says that when we walk in the light and we walk in God, we will not be shaken. Amen? Amen? Because, see, as soon as that thing gets dropped in, you ought to be going, <laughs> you ought to be getting it out real quick. Quick. Remember the word quick? What does love do? It's quick. <laughs> Not to let that stuff in. And so, so he's saying here, he said, when this stuff, you see this stuff coming up on the inside of you, you see this, you see you're acting in this stuff, we need, you know, we need to cut that thing off right there. Because we don't want darkness to take hold. We don't want darkness to have any power in our life. Like I said, there's enough darkness in this world. The Bible says, and we just read it, that we need to walk as children of light. No darkness in us. See, and that darkness in you, God, God hates the darkness in you because it keeps him from doing everything he wants to do in your life. He doesn't hate you, and he's not mad at you because you fail or because you act like a human being. <laughs> I told somebody the other day, I said, you know, I hate to pop your bubble, but you're not perfect. There was only one person that was ever perfect on the face of the earth, and that was Jesus. Yeah, and he didn't take offense at it. No, it wasn't him. But, you know, we have to, we have to understand that we're human, and, and because of, of how we were brought up and the society we live in, we're going to miss the mark occasionally. But it's what you do with the missing the mark that's important. Because I don't want any darkness in me. And see, that's what I've been praying since the 21st of August. God, if there's anything in me. You know, he started, you know, he started showing me some things that I didn't think too big. In fact, I went, I went to pastor and apologized to him. Because he showed me an attitude that I had gotten from my mother who had gotten from her mother, who had gotten from her mother, I imagine. And it was, a, a, it was an attitude of dishonor in my marriage. You know, and I, this last week I said, you know, I, you know, I saw, God showed me that. And, you know, I'm, I'm apologizing to you. I, I said, I've already repented to God. I've already renounced that, that attitude. My mother raised me to be very independent. She raised me... To that, so that if, if I had to, I could live on my own. Because, you see, when my dad was gone for 18 months, you know, in the mental hospital, she had to step up to the plate and be mom. And that was back in the, you know, the, the late 50s, early 60s, and, you know, you didn't have the assistance. My mom went to work full time, and my brother and I stayed at aunts and uncles and nurseries and grandparents and, and everything else. 
so she could make a living for us. And so she, out of that, she, she began to teach me, you be independent. And so when we started to get married, I told the, I told the pastor, I said, take obedience out of the, you know, ob obedience out of the vows. Because I didn't want to make a vow and not keep it. I knew enough about the word to know that. But it was a bad attitude, you know. Amen. Yes, amen. <laughs> you know, and it created darkness in me to where I couldn't relate to him in some areas as a wife. And, and I resented if he tried to assert me in it. I'm, you know, I'm being real honest with you. You know, and you, you think about it, you know, in the Bible, when, when, when Eve did what she did, she did it independent of her husband. She, she wasn't under his covering. She did it independent of, of her husband. And the Bible says that, um, says there, I'm trying to think of exactly how it's put, that her desire would be toward her husband. Now, that sounds sexual on the surface. But if you look that up, it means she'll ha she would have a desire to assert his authority. So that was a sin from Eve till now. And it's got in all kinds of ways. And so, so when, I begin to, when I begin to see that, I've seen pieces of that down through our marriage. And there's been times I've gone to him. You can ask him. There's been times I've gone to him and said, you know, I see that this is wrong. I can see in the word, and God's dealt with me, this is wrong, I apologize, forgive me. And, and I've done that through the years, but, but this, last, this last week, he began to show me some, show me some areas that caused me to um, have dishonor toward him in certain areas. And when you get over into dishonor, you get over into disrespect, you know, and you get over into resentment, and it, it, it'll, it'll kill a marriage. You, when you get over into, into when you get over into resentment, resentment will be is like rust. It just starts eating away until it eats through something and totally destroys it, disintegrates it. And so you've got to stay on top. When God begins to reveal things to you, when His love and His light comes to you and begins to show you even in attitudes, right. see that's a hateful attitude. He who hates his brother, he's my brother in the Lord just as much as he is my husband. He who hates his brother walks in darkness. And you give darkness power in your life and it'll destroy those areas of your life that you love and hold dear to. You'll just watch it disintegrate in front of you. And so, so it's important that 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 that, that that hate, you understand that that hate is a, det it detests, it's hateful toward, it persecutes, it's mocking, gossiping, and criticizing. And I'll tell you what, I've, I've been in church all my life. <laughs> I'm 65 years old and I have seen some stuff. I've been in from everything from little Pentecostal churches to, you know, big word of faith churches. And I have seen some stuff. I have, I have, and it's amazing to me. I, can watch, I could watch these Pentecostal grandmas just whip the devil up one side and down the other and get somebody set free and then turn around the next week and at the quilting frame, tear somebody apart. Go figure. But God loves people so he'll use anything and anybody to pray you know my mom's life was messed up in some areas but boy she could slap heaven and earth together in her praying because God loves people but there was things she could not see because she walked in hate which is unforgiveness like I said you know unforgiveness criticism you know, all that kind of stuff. That, that's hate and that's darkness. And you cannot see how to get out of where you're at until you deal with the darkness Amen. in your life. Uh, turn to, uh, we're here at First John. Turn back over to chapter 1. 
verse 7. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, in him we live and move and have our being, we're in him. It says, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another. See, I can have cornania. I can have, I can have fellowship, a deep, strong fellowship with you because of the love of God in me. You know, I, you know, I may, you know, your, your personality might not be the kind of personality that I, you know, I like to hang out with, so to speak. <laughs> That's not true. You know that. But you know what I mean? You know, your, li- your, your family dynamics is different than my family dynamics. We, I mean, if there's a baseball game, we'll do whatever we have to do to get there, you know. <laughs> Well, you may not like baseball. You know what I'm saying? So our dynamics, family dynamics and life dynamics may be totally different, but I can still have sweet fellowship with you because of the love of God. Hallelujah. I love that. That's why church family is so important. But I do emphasize the word family because I'm going to rub your fur wrong sometimes. I'm going to try mothering you sometimes when that's not my job, it's his. You know what I'm saying? You know your kids try to mother one another or father one another? You say, I'm the father of this home or I'm the mother of this house. If you got a problem with him, you come talk to me. I mean, how many times have we said that, mom and dads? You know, well, that's the same way with the body of Christ. It's God's family. It's not your job to put them in their place. God has already got them in his place, in their place, and he's working with them to keep them in that place. Don't give them an occasion to stumble. You know, Paul said this, he says, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are lawful for me to do, but because of the young ones around, I won't do it because it might cause them to stumble. You know, and, and there's some things that God may allow me to do that he won't allow you to do because of the areas he's working on your life with. That's like an alcoholic or a drug addict. You don't go hang out, you know. You don't go hang out with those people. I may be able to walk in a bar and fellowship with somebody and witness to them and bring them to the Lord, and, you know, but if you're an alcoholic, you might not be able to do that. Because the next thing you know, you're bellying up to the bar and having a drink. <laughs> you know, so God says, no, you don't do that now. There'll be a time in your life you'll be able to do that, but you're young and the devil's out after you. Don't do that. So you know what I'm saying? There's some things God will allow me to do that he might not allow you to do. But there's things that he'll allow you to do that I can't do because of my position in the body of Christ. And so, you know, you've got to, you've got to understand. That's why you can't judge what people do, right. especially according to your standards yeah. right. and the commandments God has given you. Right. See, this, this, this information will help settle a lot of things in your mind why that person can do that not, and God's not letting me do that. Oh, yeah, I'm good at it. <laughs> I know how to slam the doors, rattle the pictures without knocking them off the wall. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. That's something I'm not allowed to do anymore. You might get away with it. I don't get away with it anymore. But, but see, we don't, because we don't have the knowledge. I, I like what I heard somebody say once. Trust God, love people. You don't trust people to do everything right, but you can trust God to do everything. You love people and trust God. See, that, that's, all that, that's why you can, you can step into a situation and be vulnerable because I love this person and I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and I'm going to help them as long as God says help them. There's some people you're just enabling. And you've got to cut that off. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about God says help this person. And you say, but God, I got hurt in that situation before. It was like sticking my hand in the tiger cage and it got bit. Now you want me to stick my hand back in there? I don't think so, God. No, no, no. 
you do what God tells you to do, you love that person through the commandments of God, and you trust God to bring it out right. Because people are squirrely as Rocky and Bullwinkle. You know what I'm saying? I, I think everybody's here old enough to know Rocky and Bullwinkle. But, but people are. But when God tells you to do something, you can know that his love, remember we said one of the attributes of love was to shield? His love is strong enough to shield you in that matter. Well, what if they rip me off and I lose money in that? God got you that money before. He can get it back to you again. But don't do it unless he's telling you to do it. Because you, you'll just keep getting burned. But if he tells you to do something, even when it's outside of your perimeters of trust for people, you just shift it. I'm going to love that person and do what God tells me to do, and I'm going to trust God. And he'll get you through every time. So walk in the light as he is in the light. But he's not in it. Don't go there. If he's in it, you can walk in it with full assurance that he's going to get you through with that. I'm going to close with this. Turn with Matthew 5. I tell you, God's bringing the church into the kingdom. And... Uh, but we've got to learn the methods of the kingdom. We've got to learn. Uh, it's just like you would not go over to another country and there's some things that you can do in the United States, but you can't go do in another country. You better find out what you can and you can't do in that other country or you'll find yourself in a prison someplace calling your, your ambassador <laughs> to help you, help you get out of that place. And that's, you know, that's with the kingdom of God. We've got to understand how God functions in his kingdom. And he, he is the source of his kingdom, and the source of his power is his love. And his love will always bring light into a situation. It will illuminate a situation to where you see it like it really is. You know, somebody been, may have been acting, you know, hateful and ugly toward you for years, but all of a sudden God's, God's love compassion drops in you his light drops in you and you see that person the way God sees that person Amen. now you can deal with them if you're going to deal with them the, the experiences you've had and the things you see you know it's not going to work out but when you let God show you that's the only way we can pastor is to let God show us who people are and people come and you know they come and complain about so and so you know, so-and-so's doing this or so-and-so's doing that or how are we going to handle this, you know. I say, hmm, somebody's pushed your button, I see. Somebody just pulled the lever on your love gauge. <laughs> this isn't about them, it's about you. <laughs> and so, but when you, because you don't know why that person acted the way they did. You know what experiences in life they've had that caused them to have that kind of attitude in their life. You've got to let God show you through his love and his light and illumination, revelation about that person's purpose and their destiny and then work with God to help them get into their destiny. Quit working with the devil to keep them out of it. Your words is just like your words of, of praise and worship and love and adoration causes the power of God to increase in your atmosphere. When you begin to speak about somebody and talk about somebody and, and put somebody down and criticize them and they shouldn't have done that and they shouldn't have done this, you're changing the atmosphere around that person. Amen. And it's not good. It's like pouring gasoline on a fire that you're wanting to put out. You want that person to stop acting that way. Well, quit giving, a, giving the devil wood for the fire. The Bible says in Proverbs, when you, when you stop putting wood on a fire, it goes out. Your words are like woods. They're building blocks that the devil can use to destroy another person's life. And I don't know about you. I want to see people helped. I want to see, 
you know, somebody may be doing their ministry all wrong. I mean, not only to your opinion, but according to the word. They may not walk in in love. You know, they might, uh, they might be just doing things that are not, don't line up with the scripture. But that's not my job to change their life. It's God's job and the Holy Spirit to work with them and help them. But if they're walking in darkness and can't see, we can pray light into their life. They can get on the path that they need to get on and be what God's called them to be. I don't know about you, but I, we, the church needs lots of warriors. They need lots of warriors. And just because somebody's struggling in their flesh... I'm not going to kick them when they're down. I'm not going to make their struggle worse with my words. I'm going to pray and preach the light in, into them and, and, and let God work with them, let his love work with them. Have you found Matthew 5? I'm sorry. I get to talk and I don't even go there myself. Hallelujah. Matthew 5. Yeah. Verse 14. You, say me, are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. You are the light. Jesus was the light when he came, but he deposited something in you through his death and resurrection and you receiving him as Savior. He deposited a light in you. Now, the devil does everything. It say, now, the next verse, it says, uh, it says, Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. I don't know about you, but I want people when they're around me to be glorifying God. And, and, and he's saying here, you know, you don't take a light and snuff it out. You don't take a light and cover it up. Now, the devil wants to cover it up. And we're going to continually have to push those baskets off. You know, and he'll, he'll do it by trying to get you into a dark area. He's got the advantage in darkness. You don't. You have the advantage in light. And you'll win every time when you stay in light. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you and we praise you that you are teaching us and showing us how to live in your kingdom. Father God, I declare and I decree over this group of people that they are mighty warriors in the kingdom of God. Father, they are established, that their feet is, is, is firmly established and grounded in your love. Father God, you bring them to a comprehension of the breadth and the length and the depth and the height that they know the love of God. They have it, they've experienced it, and because they've experienced it, they can share it with others. Father God, that that experience in them is like a fire. It's like a light, God, in a dark, cold world that, Father, people are drawn to. Father, I declare and I decree over these people that they are children of light and they walk in light as you are in the light. Father, we walk in you and we go where you tell us to go. We say what you tell us to say. We're just like Jesus. We don't go any place. We don't say any place unless we've heard you say it or we've heard you tell us to go. And we don't do anything unless we see what you want done. And Father God, I thank you and I praise you that as we walk in you, we shine as bright beacons in this city, in this community. And Father God, people see us coming, they'll just see a ball of light coming. Because God, your love is working in us and through us and out of us into this world. Father God, I thank you and I praise you that as, that as we walk with you day by day, that Father, you... You cause light to shine in those dark corners, those dark recesses of our life. Life, Father God, we open every door, every window, every closet, every drawer. And Father God, we thank you and we praise you that your disinfecting light comes to us and disinfects us from the, from the harms and traumas and hurts of this life. And Father God, we learn to walk in the love of God and walk in the light that shines so bright. 
Father, I declare and decree over these people that this will be a week of light for them. Father, that you will show them, you will illuminate to them those areas of darkness so that they can replace the darkness with your light. And Father God, I thank you and I praise you that, that we are a bright, shining people in this world. And we thank you and we praise you for all your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor, amen. Praise God. We'll have a good week. Walk in the light. Amen.